the word of the Lord. We're going to go back to 2 Timothy, please, chapter 2. And I'm going to pick up this afternoon where I left off. I'm going to just launch out into this, uh, if you will, and we're going to go there. How about if we just have a word of thanksgiving to the Lord and as we go into this message. Father God, we just thank You. We praise You, Lord, for this opportunity here this afternoon. We thank You for those that are gathered in Your name. We thank You for those that are here. We thank You, dear God, for the men and the women, for the fathers of this church and the fathers that are not here that have been witness to, Lord, that have, have made the way so that we could be here this afternoon. We just praise You for that. We're asking You, God, just to anoint us again this afternoon to minister the Word, and that the Word might lodge in our hearts, that Your name might be praised and glorified. In Jesus' wonderful name, Amen, Amen. You may be seated here this afternoon. I want to share with you and conclude this message on passing the torch. Passing the torch. I talked about two things that uh, Paul gave in, in admonition to Timothy. This is his son in the faith. And I mentioned two of them this morning. Spent quite a bit of time with the second one. The first is, is that we've got to keep the fire burning. That fire is a love. It is God's presence. It is His fullness in our life. The Spirit of the living God. And that Spirit is not one of fear. It is one of power, love, and a sound mind. If we've ever needed that today, we need it now. There is so much to make us fearful. We need the Spirit of God more than ever. Secondly, I talked to you about being strong. He says, Timothy, to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. It's His favor that we need. It's His strength that we need. It's the grace that's in Him. We're not looking for the strength of ability. We're not looking for the strength of, of any kind of social status. We're not looking for the strength of material wealth. We need the strength of Almighty God, the strength of Jesus Christ, and that comes from His grace. That's the second thing that we mentioned. I'd like to go to the third here this afternoon, please, and I'm going to begin in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 15. He says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. Now you will hear him after this talk a lot about truth. He will talk about it in this uh, throughout the rest of this epistle. The first thing he says is Timothy is to rightly divide the word of truth. But then he talks about how folks will err from the truth and how that they will, uh, will not acknowledge the truth and that they will ever learn and not be able to come to the knowledge. They will resist the truth. They'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned under fables. But what this young man is to do is to rightly divide the word of truth. He is to know the word of truth. And then he says, in connection with that, I'll come back somewhat to the word later, but he says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. There are several times in this passage that he tells Timothy there are some things that you need to avoid. You need to guard your life. He says that their word will eat as doth a canker, who, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who can Concerning the truth hath erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Can you imagine it? Can you imagine it? This is within 40 years. This is within 40 years, uh, less than that. Maybe 30. Somewhere between 30 and 40 years after the actual resurrection of Jesus Christ. At this time when Paul writes this epistle, there are people still living that witness the resurrected Lord. John, the apostle, was still alive. And he met, he touched, his hands handled the Lord Jesus Christ after he rose from the dead. There are living witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there are men that have the audacity to come into the church and say, it's already passed, it's not coming, your resurrection is not down the road. That negates the coming of the Lord and negates His return for us. And it becomes a live, eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die mentality. And it's hard to imagine that within 30 years of the church already, the very principal foundation, foundational doctrine of the church has already been corrupted, already been tainted, and men are preaching a message contrary to the truth that was a reality and is presently a reality today. 
What I want you to see is that he tells him. So he says that you're to shun the profane, uh, uh, vain babblings. That is talk uh, that, that leads nowhere. It's profane and that it's, it, it's something that is debasing. It lowers the sanctity and the, the, the purity of the Word of God. There are some men, I don't know if you have noticed it, but if you ever listen to, to the way that many pulpit tears today, I'll call them that. I wouldn't call them preachers of the gospel, though they claim to be preachers of the gospel, that the way they talk about the Scripture and the things they, they talk about from the pulpit are absolutely profane. There is a sense in which this the, the talk of Scripture has become commonplace. It's no longer sacred. It's something something that's profane is the idea of something that's not sacred. It's common. You can use it for whatever. It doesn't have a sacred purpose. When the, te- the articles of the temple were sanctified for the temple, they weren't profane. They were sanctified. They weren't for common use. They were for particular sacred use. I mean, the fork you used to eat your food, that was a common thing. You just, you did it. If it fell on the ground, you washed it. No big deal. It wasn't something you took to the temple to use for that. Uh, we're, we're not to be profane. We're not to have that kind of access in our life so that just to anything goes mentality, do what you want to. Anybody can do what they want to know. We are a sacred possession of God, a sanctified vessel under God, and we have a particular holy purpose and use in this world through the hand of God. And he tells him that their word will eat as doth a canker. It's a, it's a disease that will destroy like rust or a cancer. And he will eat away. And he said that, uh, he goes on and talks about in verse 19 and 20, that the foundation of God stands true. It has this seal. Tells him that uh, there's a lot of vessels in the house. Some of gold and silver. Some of wood and earth. Some to honor. Some to dishonor. In verse 21, if a man therefore purge himself from these... If a man therefore purge himself from these. In this context, what are the these? In this context, it is to purge ourselves from those who teach things contrary to the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Those who teach things contrary to the truth of God, you and I are not to spend time in their company. That's just the way it is. We are to cleanse ourselves, to purge ourselves from them, and to remove ourselves from the present. Because if you sit and listen to falsehood long enough, it's bound to have an effect upon your life. Hitler talked about it, just tell the lie often enough, and after a while, folks will start to believe it like it's a truth, and it's a fact. We've got a lot of times in this nation, there are a lot of lies that have been told about the founding of our nation, and perspectives that are wrong. You tell them often enough, and people will believe them. They'll think all of our founders were deists. They'll think all of our founders were men who didn't know God or believe in God, when quite ever, the evidence is quite to the the contrary of that. But forget the evidence. It's just what people are talking about. I was listening yesterday to, uh, or the day before, to a radio program on focus on the family. And, and I may be sometime preaching something about it in the future. But a recent book has been uh, written. A woman by the name of Phyllis uh, Schlafly. And also her niece. And I do not remember her name. But nevertheless the uh, uh, Vinker I think was her name. Suzanne Vinker. But anyway these uh, two ladies. Uh, this Schlafly was supposedly very adamant and a, a very conservative woman who spoke out against feminism back when it took a stronghold. Betty Friedan will write her uh, uh, feminine mystique and there will be in the 60s will come a tremendous uh, feminist movement across our nation and across this land. Betty Friedan said that uh, it was easier for her to start a revolution uh, 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 and a movement than it was for her to change her own life. That's the beginning of feminism in this nation. Rather than just overcome her poor childhood, overcome her abusive past, and she just starts a movement that women are the victim and men are the uh, the abusers and that they're a bunch of male chauvinist pigs and they don't care for women and then women have been victimized by this kind of patriarchal society and this business of male chauvinism. And I was, I was listening to uh, this woman and some things that, that she was saying about the movement and whatnot and thinking about it, I've lost my thought. God help me tonight. I need your help this afternoon. Oh, praise the Lord. Well, I'll have to come back to it. 
I sometimes get sidetracked on that and I was thinking so much. But anyway, this woman, and she opposed feminism uh, uh, coming into this nation. But nevertheless, there is, let me go back and I'll come back to it in a minute. I'm sorry, just forgive me. I'll just come back to it and the Lord brings it back to me. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back to you and I'll share it with you. But nevertheless, in this business that Paul talks about, there is this influence that has come to the, uh, to the people that has come into the church world. A negative influence in reference to, reference to the resurrection of fundamental doctrine. The word is, is like a canker. It's profane. It's vain babblings. And it uh, makes everybody no longer, or, or the word of God is no longer sacred. Now, what I want you to understand about this is the principle behind it. And then I'm going to deal with some of the particulars in the, in the passage. Paul was concerned in reference to Timothy that Timothy guarded the influences in his life. If you and I are going to meet the challenge of our hour, we're going to have to guard the influences that are in our life. There are things that you and I hear. There are people that we listen to. And you and I are going to have to guard where we are with all of that and what we're going to do. We, the things around us are going to affect us. They're going to influence us. And, and they're going to push us in certain directions. And we need to guard that. One of the first things he exhorts him in verse 16 is I've read but shun profane and vain babblings for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You're going to have to watch what you listen to. Babblings. This is men talking, sharing things, talking about things. He said shun them. They're vain. If that talk is fruitless, you don't need to sit around and listen to it. If it's not going to build you up, if it's not going to make you a stronger Christian, if it's going to uh, uh, take the things of God and make them calm, as if they're no value any longer and they're not sacred and we've done that. We've secularized the gospel. It's no longer something sacred. You plaster it on your t-shirt. You plaster it on a billboard. God is no longer, than a, or, or no longer he's nothing more than a marketing gimmick and some kind of scheme that we've concocted and we've resorted to all things in order to market our God. We don't need to think that God has to be marketed. He's not to be profaned and the talk about him needs to be holy it needs to be fruitful and it needs to be profitable. You've got to watch what you listen to if you are going to be able to make it in this hour. Sometimes I don't think we understand the things that influence us. Number one, watch what you listen to. Number two, watch your friends. Notice verse 21, as I, I said, if a man therefore purge himself from these. Now he was talking about the people themselves, not just the doctrines that they promoted, but the people themselves. In verse 19 and 20, he's talking about vessels. He's talking about people, those that are vessels of honor, those that are vessels of dishonor, those that are... Uh, that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity and he said that uh, though but in great houses there's different kinds of vessel some are honorable some are dishonorable and we've got that in some sense Christianity is a great house and you listen carefully to what I'm about to say we've got to watch it there does come a time where you and I are I pray about it I prayed about it yesterday as I was or not yesterday but Friday as I was going to witness to uh, uh, this couple and I, I I shared with them the word of God and I prayed before before I went, God, I don't want to waste my time. Now, I don't know about you, but time's precious to me. It seems like we've got far too little of it. It is absolutely going here and there. And I want to do what is most fruitful. I want to spend my time wisely. And I'm trying to think about that and be more conscious, conscious, uh, conscientious rather, about how I spend my time. And, and I said, Lord, you know, I don't want to go here if, the, if this is just going to be a fruitless path. Well, I didn't feel that. And the Lord, Spirit of the Lord, let me to go and preach the gospel. But we need to understand there's going to come a time, particularly where we are, that the gospel needs to be preached. It needs to be preached decisively. And when it's clear that people have rejected the gospel, we don't need to sit there and spin our wheels. We don't need to sit there and think, oh, we got to love them. Yeah, you sit there and love yourself to death. And what you're going to do is they're going to drain you dry and you're going to waste your energies and resources where it doesn't be wasted. I know there's a lot of things happening right now and I've been asking God, 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 you open the doors you want me to go through. You shut the doors you don't want us to go through. Because, Lord, I don't want to waste the time and the energy where it should not be wasted. We are there, my friend. And if a field becomes unfruitful, if someone's clearly rejected the gospel, then you and I may have to part company and move on and preach elsewhere. Amen. That's just the fact the way it is. 
You got to guard your company. Young men, I'll tell you, you see, somewhere fathers, we've got to be concerned about the influences. I, I, I'm amazed at that. I, I really am. I, I, I don't know, for whatever reason, by various people outside of, outside of our, our own movement and, and sometimes inside our own movement. I mean, early on, I remember in our life when we raised our children, we raising our daughters. There were things, there were times that, that sometimes folks did things. There were sometimes things that folks did inside the church. There were, and I can't say that they were in and of themselves wrong. There were sometimes young people got together and they did some things. And I can't tell you that what they did was wrong. I can't tell you that. But there was something since that I couldn't always even explain it. But I'm telling you that I just felt a sense in my spirit. This is not where I need to go. This is not where my daughters need to be. This is is not a kind of atmosphere that is conducive to building them up in Jesus Christ. And sometimes if it was a particular event where uh, uh, my daughters are going to be, you know, there's a, a bunch of young people getting together, staying up half the night, doing nothing but a bunch of silliness and telling silly stories and, 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 and just uh, sometimes a bunch of nonsense that didn't need to be going on. And I know that maybe, you know, you say, ah, there's nothing wrong with it. Well, maybe not. But I, I made a decision. I, I was a father. I had to answer for God. And I was concerned about the influences because I know children's minds are easily moved. Children's minds are easily influenced. They're, they will quickly imitate someone. And we did that through their life. We watched it. If I could discern, and I, I keep my eye on my daughters, if I could discern that they were beginning to cop an attitude, as we say, that they shouldn't be doing. If I could begin to sense that there's something about their spirituality that's not what it used to be, then I'm going to tell you that we we said, okay, what's going on here? What influences come into their life? Whose company? Who have they been spending time with that has been influencing them so that now you can hear that little hint of rebellion in their voice. You can hear that little hint of talking back in their voice. You can hear that little hint of reason. And it wasn't reasoning I give them. They're thinking along a vein they don't need to think about. Some influence has come into their life. you got to guard the influences. you got to watch over it, folks. You gotta guard it in your life, we gotta guard it in our children's lives. Amen. So there are some things that we've chosen not to do. There are some things maybe we've chosen to do that other folks think maybe we shouldn't have done. I don't know, but I can tell you right now that you gotta be careful what you listen to, and you gotta be careful the people that you spend time with, and we watch that, and we could see certain things. There were some, sometimes our, our daughters would spend time with someone, and we would say, I can see something, I can hear someone else talking through you. This is not a path we want you to go down. This is not the kind of life that you need to be living in, the kind of talk that we want to hear coming from you. So you need to push it aside. And we had to take that influence out of their life. I know there are folks today that think, well, we're wrong because we take our, our, our children at a, at a particular young age and we shelter them. Yes, we do shelter them. But while we're sheltering them, we're building them. We're not sheltering them to tell them a lie. We're not sheltering them so that we can somehow, uh, because we've deceived ourselves into thinking that they're never going to confront evil that's in this world. That's not why we're sheltering them. We're sheltering them so we can instill the right principles in them so that when they do meet the evil of this world, they'll know how to meet that evil. They'll know how to confront that wicked spirit and they'll know what to do about it because they'll be strong enough to stand from it. I do not believe that God wants us to plunge the minds of our children and into some kind of moral cesspool of sin. I don't think that God wants us to do that. He wants them naive to that which is wicked and wise to that which is good. And you and I have got a responsibility to guard the influences that are in their lives. You get amazed sometimes in stories I hear. Folks wake up one day and you know, just couldn't understand. Why? Why did this happen? Why? Where did this attitude come from in my child? Well, it happened several years or months ago when you, you let this influence. My mom and dad weren't perfect in everything. But they still had a watch over me. Seventeen years of age, I graduated from high school. I walked across the platform in salutatorian in my class. I had a second highest grade point average in my class. I had one B in all my high school years. 
Before that, I won what was called the Lulu May Heskett Scholarship to go to Potomac State College in Kaiser, West Virginia. My entire first two years of college was paid for. The first day of college, the only thing I had to pay was $14 in order to cover a few books. Everything else was paid for. But, you know, I was so happy about that. My teachers were happy. They were excited because of my accomplishment. And what I've done, I was going to study to be a CPA, an accountant. And uh, this was a good school. It was, and so I, I went. Uh, it was about 75 minutes or so, hour and a half or more so, driving from my home. So it wasn't, uh, I really wasn't able to stay at home and to go to school there. So I went and I lived on campus. I had a roommate that I chose from the high school that I, uh, I went to. And uh, we had been friends in high school. He wasn't a Christian. He was a young man from uh, Vietnam, I believe. And uh, he was an exchange student and come from Vietnam. I always seem to take up with the uh, castaways, whatever, whatever castaway, whatever poor greasy haired kid that nobody else had fooled with when they was in school. That was my friend, I assure you. That was the one that I spent time with. And whatever uh, the jocks didn't spend any time with me, whoever had uh, uh, was, was the outcast, that was my friend usually in high school, and I befriended them. And so him and I were friends, and we were roommates, and I thought, this will be all right. You know, I'm going to be fine. And, and we went down there. Well, I come to find out when even my roommate gets away from, from home or whatever, that uh, he's not quite that innocent fellow I thought he was. And, and uh, you know, one, one day I, I turned around, and he's bringing in this big old jug of wine in the room, and I'm just, I've never even seen such a thing before. I, I don't even, you know, and of course, I'm not going to partake of that. And I'm doing my best, honestly, that I know of. I'm, re, I'm trying to read my Bible, but there's constant distractions. You can walk out in the hall of the dorm room and there's times you could smell the marijuana smoke that, you know, they're, they're smoking, they're dope. And that was a big thing in those days. And, and uh, you know, they're drinking. There's all kinds of bad talk and things that are going on. I'm doing my best to hold on. Weekends, I'm going home and spending time there and, and you know, being in church. And during the week, I'm back in school. That's why I don't know how folks survive being Sunday Christians. I mean, I just, I'm telling you, I, I, and Sunday morning saints, it is, I don't know how in the world I cannot do it, but, but I went back and, and uh, I, I, I just uh, would go there. And it, it, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't praying like I needed to pray. I, wasn't, I was trying my best, but how do you pray in a room? How do you find uh, any kind of solitude in a place where you got, you know, your, your, your uh, uh, roommate, he might be having a hangover, and, and you've got this going on and that going on in the room, and I think he took up smoking. I don't know, all kinds of mess going on. I'm fooling myself. I'm thinking, I've got this down. I'm doing okay. And, and you know, I called Daddy. He called me and I answered on the phone there in the dorm room. And, and then until finally one day, I come home and I can tell it's getting bad. And my mom and daddy sensed it. They watched over me. Something was changing in my spirit. Although I couldn't discern it at the time. I'm, I'm deceiving myself. I'm doing okay. I'm still praying. I'm still trying to read my Bible. I'm still trying to be the best little boy that I know how to be. 17 years, not even dry behind the ears. And so finally I go home in October. I mean, it's not more than hardly two months after I've been in school and I'm sitting in, my, in the kitchen. I can remember it to this day. I'm sitting on the edge of the chair. My mama's over by the cook stove and she's fixing something there. And I'm just there and she's been talking with me and I'm kind of hanging my head. And she looks at me and she says, you're not the same son that I sent away to college. She reckoned something, recognized some influence had come into my life and it was having an effect upon my soul. I broke apart and wept and cried before God and I went back the next day, Monday morning, or two days after. That was on a Saturday. I went back on a Monday morning. I walked into that school and I disappointed every one of them. I said, I want you to know, I cannot make it. I cannot do it. I gave up my scholarship. I left aside that $2,000 scholarship and I went home because to me my soul was more important than my education and mom and daddy had recognized the bad influence in my life. How many times are parents so engrossed in their own things they can't even discern, they don't even have enough of the Holy Ghost of God to discern when something is going south in the character of their children? Right. It never happens overnight. Right. If my mom and daddy hadn't got a hold of me then, I'd have been a goner church. But God knew how to reach me. And mom and daddy had enough love to care for me. The third thing you've got to do is watch your appetites. Verse 22, flee also youthful lust. What are those youthful lusts? 
Fornication is one of them. I'm going to tell you something, young men. You're going to need to receive the power of God like you never received the power of God. Or you're not going to maintain sexual purity in this culture. Because I'm telling you that our culture is inundated with sex. Perverted sex. Outside the law of God. You can't walk down the street. Folks talk about television. Forget television. All you got to do is go to Walmart. Right. That's the truth. That's right. All you got to do is just go to work. Yeah, right. You know, all you got to do is pick up your mail for the day. Right. Sale paper. It's everywhere. It's on every billboard. It's in every corner. It arrests my spirit every time I go out. And I'm like, God, I thank you for your power and the keeping power. And I'm telling you, evermore, I thank God for the power of the Holy Ghost. But I'm just telling you right now, there's some things you're going to have to run from. And that's one of them you better learn to run from. You better learn to get the power of the Holy Ghost to give you enough gumption to get up and move on out and say, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. I'm not going to let myself become gripped by this thing. And it will. Oh, don't think you'll sit there and you'll overcome it in your strength. You can make your promises. You can think you got it all together. I'm telling you, if you don't have the power of the Holy Ghost sometimes to pick you up enough and say it's time for me to get out of here. I need to move myself on down the road. You're going to be in a heap of trouble. It's an influence that will come to your life. It will cause an appetite to come inside of you and you're going to have to guard yourself and you're going to have to move forward and say I don't want that. Youthful lust. It's easy for young men, young women to get caught up in trinkets and toys, technology. We get so caught up spending our money and doing things of this nature that have no value in where we're going in the future. We can waste two, three, four, five hundred dollars at a pop. Money into this technology, into that technology, and into that technology. And yet somewhere it doesn't help us down the road for where we need to prepare and where we're going and our money is not being spent for the kingdom of God and the way that it needs to be spent. I'm going to tell you something. Youthful lust will get you caught up with gadgets and things. You have no responsibility. You have no family. You have no children to take care of. And you say, well, it's just me. It's no big deal. And I'm just living at home. And I know I'm being plain this afternoon. But this is what Paul was telling Timothy. There's some youthful lust, my friend, had to get a hold of. And you better learn to run from those things and follow after righteousness and follow after faith and charity and peace with them to call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Do not think you're exempt from those things. Do not think you can stand in this culture and that you're tough and it won't get a hold of you. I'm telling you, I was there and it got a hold of me and it can still get a hold of me. I've got to guard my own life and I've got to guard my own passions and when something's getting a hold of you, you better learn to run and say, I can't hang around here any longer. It seems that there are very few Josephs in the world. You've got to watch your appetites. You've got to watch your thinking. Verse 23. The foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. Unlearned here means, it's the idea of a word that means undisciplined. It's a questions that come from a Undisciplined questions from an untrained mind. Questions which do not proceed from a trained habit of thinking. Unlearned questions. Young men, young ladies, listen to me very carefully here this afternoon. You have got to learn to mold your thinking, not just what you think about, but your thinking processes. I'm not just concerned with what my child thinks, but how my child thinks. I hope you understand that. You see, if we don't have the right thinking processes, then there are all sorts of deceivers out there when we're dead and gone that will easily dupe our children because they haven't learned and disciplined their mind to think along certain trains of thought, along certain principles. I thank God that God has placed some men in my life. I've shared with you before that how, how great uh, of a blessing to me that Brother Messer has been in this line of thinking. Because when I go to study the Scripture and I study things, 
Talking to that man is many times revolutionized my thinking. I can tell you when many times my thinking process has changed. But it taught me to think biblically. There are certain things that I have to have down pat. Certain processes. There's a law, for example. Certain things in in terms of logic. I think it's called the law of non-contradiction or something like that. Something can't be A and non-A at the same time. In other words, it can't be a yes and a no. It can't be a true and a false at the same time. It's either true, or, but there's only one little part wrong, that it's false. It can't be true and false at the same time. It's either true or it's false. I don't care if one-tenth of a percent of it is false. I don't care if just one little word of it's false. It makes the whole thing false. But many times in our world today, our world has been dumbed down. Our youth has been absolutely in, in public school arenas. Folks have thought we didn't want them to go to public school just because of the environment. Well, it's not just because of the environment. That's bad enough. Yeah, I don't want my kids hanging out with, with other kids that have watched X-rated, R-ratedness, and all they talk about is garbage and filth, and they go to the bathrooms and all the mess that goes on. And you can try to ignore it and tell me it doesn't happen. It does happen. Their lives are filled with it. Yeah, we don't want that kind of influence, but it's more than that. It's a constant bombardment of a mindset that has come through our educational institutions and our liberal thinkers in this world and are trying to get our young people to think along the line that is wrong and now I'll remember what I wanted to say earlier about the feminist movement I knew it would come back somewhere in the 1960s when this movement began this woman I mentioned to you Phyllis Schlafly she began to speak out against it Jimmy Carter presidents during that time period and the movement trying to equal rights amendment, amendment to the Constitution, tried to turn this nation to liberalism headlong. Invited all these thinkers, thinkers, and I, I might talk about that more later in another message, but the point I wanted to make was this most of America didn't buy that garbage. Most of America didn't want anything to do with it. The liberals didn't control the nation, but they controlled the media. Right. That's right. And the media preached it, yeah. and they preached it, yeah. and they preached it. You may think today Fox News is conservative. They're not. There are ladies testified. There's some stories that they won't ever do. These books, this book, The Flip Side of Feminism, will not be picked up. They've tried to get Fox News to do a story on it. They will not do a story on it. Why? Because they don't want to get mamas back in their homes. They don't want to get mamas back where they ought to be raising their children and supporting and honoring their husbands. They want them to be career oriented. And the one thing they will not talk about is the wrong that has happened in daycares. They won't talk about the effect that it's had on the nation when mama, after a few months, is back off, dropping that baby off at a daycare, and someone other than mama and daddy is raising that children. And I don't know if that's sensitive or not. It ought not be in this church by now. But I'm telling you something. The mainstream media will not go there. We think they're conservative. They're not interested in going back to a Bible-based culture. They're not interested in going back to a Bible-based world. Oh, they'd like to maintain our, our, our sense of prosperity and they'd like to have their freedoms to do their things and they realize that even liberals are losing their freedoms everywhere as far as we go every time we make it of the law everybody's losing freedoms throughout this nation and they don't want that but they're not interested in going back to a pre-World War II era where women thought that it was better to be in the home and honoring their husbands right, amen. it was a time when father knows best But the media preached it and preached it and preached it and it's all people heard until they finally bought it. Adolf Hitler understood that principle. He understood that principle in Nazi Germany. I quote, 
He said this in 1938 when he made public education compulsory, mandatory. The youth of today is ever the people of tomorrow. For this reason, we have set before ourselves the task of inoculating our youth with the spirit of this community of the people at a very early age, at an age when human beings are still unperverted and therefore unspoiled. This Reich stands and it is building itself up for the future upon its youth and this new Reich will give its youth to no one but will itself take youth and give to youth its own education and its own upbringing. Words of Adolf Hitler, 1938, when he makes public education compulsory, and we thought today it's no big deal. I'm telling you what has systematically been taking in America, place in America over the past decades is they have systematically been inundating the minds of our children with perverted philosophies, with liberal mindsets, and they come out of school now and they don't even know how to think any differently than what they've been told to think of with their educators. We need some young men and some young women that can walk out in the middle of that morass of of, of public thinking and say, here we are and we're going to think by the Bible. Our mind's been molded and shaped by the Word of God and we're going to think along right lines that A is still A, B is still B, black is still black, white is still white, right is still right as God sees it, and wrong is still wrong as as the Bible declares it to so be. Amen. So we ask our children, why do you think like that? And we need our children whose thinking is not shaped by conservative television, but by the true thinking from God's Word. Unlearned questions. There are people that ask questions, all kinds of questions today. And I'm telling you, this world can get you thinking. And long lines and ask you questions. And you think, well, I don't know. And I don't know how there's... Well, yeah, that sounds right to me. And it'll sound right to you if you don't have enough of God's Word and God's sense in you to know what is right and what is wrong and to think properly. What you're thinking. Chapter 3. Perilous times are going to come. Men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. What a terrible list. Do you hear what the apostle is saying? Can you imagine when Timothy is reading this? He is in Ephesus. There has already been a struggle. There's already been false elders that have risen up among them, seeking to draw away disciples as Paul prophesied to them in Acts chapter 20 when he told them what was going to happen. And Timothy is in the midst of that. And he thinks, maybe Paul's going to give me a message of hope. It's a message of hope, but it's a real message. Timothy, perilous times, dangerous times. That is, they will cause peril, danger to your soul. Living in a kind of culture with this kind of people having a form of godliness but denying the power of it is a dangerous world to live in. Amen. People in the churches today are no different than the world. Right. Behind that religion, behind that facade of godliness, there is no life principle in them. And they can talk about holiness. They can talk about God being holy. And it's much like the phone call that we got in reference to our sign. Somebody accusing us. I guarantee you she claimed to serve the God of the Bible. But we have so convinced ourselves that a God that would send anybody to hell, a God that would condemn, uh, that man can't help it that he's a homosexual, that woman can't help it that she's a lesbian. Really. I'm amazed that even when science disproves them, they will still go against it. Science, there's absolutely no proof whatsoever and actually evidence to the contrary that young boys and girls are born differently. There's a clear difference in their genetic makeup. There's a difference in their brains. There's a difference with how they're wired. There's a difference with how they're put together. They're not perverted when they're born. They're perverted when we expose them to that mess and mama emasculates her child and she will not let him know the masculinity 
many times, so many uh, uh, single parent homes in this land, and that child knows nothing of a, a father who can give him any sense of masculinity. We have feminized our nation, and our men are weak in walking around, and we wonder everything's okay, and it's going to be all right, and our God would not do this. We have feminized our God, and we have forgot. He's a God of war. He's a God of justice. He's a God of truth. He's a God of righteousness. And He is a Lord of glory, a captain and general, and a Lord of hosts of armies. We don't even think masculine any longer. You got all this mess, and it's in the form of godliness. It puts on the garb of Christianity. It wears the cloak of Jesus while inside. There's disobedience. There's betrayal. There's greed. There's blasphemy. There's un- ingratitude. In verse 6, this is the sort that creeps into your house and lead captive silly women laden with sins. The f- sixth thing I want to tell you here this afternoon, or fifth thing, is you're going to have to guard your home. Guard the influences in your life. Guard what comes into your house. I think that Paul could have prophesied that. And had he known it, in 2 Timothy 3 and 6, he could have inserted TBN in there. How they sneak into your house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they lead captive silly women laden with sins. They don't knock on your front door. They don't barge into your home. No, they just very subtly creep in alongside. I'm going to tell you something. We've got something to guard. I don't know about you. I know how it's been and what I try to do in my own life. But God, help me. But when I see something, it's not quite right in my house. I see some attitude or, or something. That's, my house is not going the way it needs to go. Then it's time to shut it down. Shut it down right here and now. Let's find out what's going on. Let's see what's coming on around here. Why are we having this kind of thinking? Where is this going? Because this is not the road God has chosen for us. If you're not alert to that danger and you don't realize you live in a dangerous hour, my friend, this is not an hour in which you can afford to be relaxed and say everything's hunky dory. It's not hunky dory. You need to understand you're living in an hour that will devour you, deceive you, and destroy you. Oh, glory. I don't have time to hang there. I've got to close. You get this thing, this last couple of principles. Chapter 3, verse 14. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. I've mentioned this already, but now I want to emphasize it. The fourth thing you've got to do, he tells Timothy, is you've got to equip yourself. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. Thoroughly furnished means fully equipped unto all good works. Huh. We've got a lot of folks going out trying to do good, and they're not equipped to do good. They're going out trying to do something for the Lord, and they're not equipped to do something for the Lord. And what equips you is the Scripture. The power of the Holy Ghost, but the emphasis is here upon, and that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures. Now, what I want you to understand the emphasis about that, he did not say, and from a child that has known the Holy Word. Well, by the words, I thought it was the same. True, it is the same, but there's a difference. I don't even know if that made sense. It's the same, but there's a difference. That seemed like a contradictory statement, didn't it? Yeah, but there is a distinction. What is the distinction? Whenever the word Scripture is used... It refers particularly to what is written. When we talk about the Word, we talk about something that is spoken. Preach the Word. You're speaking the spoken Word of God. And it goes out and people are listening to it audibly. They're hearing the Word. But when he said, Timothy, you've known the Scriptures. He meant you're acquainted with the writings You know the written Word of God. I talk to people sometimes in the holiness movement and they can tell you, they can repeat more from what they have heard from preachers than they can of the Scripture. They know what's 
what's been preached, but they don't know what's been written. Someone can lead you astray if all you've got of the Scripture or the Word is what someone's preached to you. It's good as long as you've got a good preacher, that's fine. But if you don't know what's written, you can be led astray. You've got to know the Scripture. The emphasis is upon what's been written down in the script, what's been placed in writing. God put it in writing for us, and we have it in this age. Thank be to God. I'm so glad for the written Word of the Lord, because I can refer to it again and again and again, and I know where that's at, I know where that's located, and I can sit down and say, here it is, it is written, it is written. Jesus said that. He was acquainted with the Scriptures. It is written, Satan. I should not live up but alone, but the word is proceed. He didn't say somebody told me. He didn't say daddy preached it to me. He read it for himself. Our authority is not in so much the preached word. Our authority is in the written word of God. Somewhere we've got to learn to equip our children with what's written. How much scripture have you memorized? How much scripture can you quote? If I say, tell me right now the chapter in the, in the New Testament that deals with the resurrection entirely, what chapter would it be? If I were to tell me, to ask you, tell me the overriding theme of the Gospel of John. If I were to ask you, tell me what epistle primarily deals with the second coming of Jesus Christ, what could you answer? We can talk about good messages. We can remember what this preacher said, so and so. I remember this saying. I remember what this preacher said. I remember what that preacher said. That's all good. Good men say good things, and there's nothing wrong with remembering. But I'm telling you, that's not the authority. That old world out there isn't going to take it. Your answer when you say, Well, preacher, so and so said it. You need an authority higher than the preacher. You need an authority higher than your church manual. You need an authority higher than the church discipline. You need the written word of God. I cannot go beyond. That hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Truth. <coughs> Woo-hoo. Yeah. We're taking this written word for granted. It gets snatched away from us, we're gonna see what we've got. Equip yourself with the scripture. I find out something, I go out to witness people and talk to people. If you don't know scripture, you're gonna be stumbling over yourself in a little bit. Amen. You're going to be. I don't know what to say. It's because you're not acquainted with the written word of God. And you don't know where to point to to contradict what they say. And my final point here this afternoon, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. The word instant means ready. It means to be at hand. Matter of fact, it is used. Look down at verse 6. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. The word at hand there is the same word as instant back in verse 2. It means be at hand, be at attention, be present, be on target, be there, be ready, stand up. Now, I want you to listen to me. I want to talk a little bit about this verse, and I want to give you a principle behind it. He said, I want you to preach the Word. I want you to be there. I want you to be on the job. I want you to be ready. And I want you to do it when it's in season and when it's out of season. Now, what does he mean by in season and out of season? In season is a time whenever it's opportune. It's convenient. It is an acceptable time. There was a time in this land, it wasn't as hard to preach as it is now. It was in season. You could preach holiness. You could preach about how a man or a woman should dress themselves. And you weren't thought about as crazy. Because the Methodists, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, 
Nearly every Protestant denomination believe that there ought to be a modest dress and a modest appearance. My brother and I was sharing a little bit about it over, over uh, a lunch. In the Methodist church up to 1852, it is written in their doctrine, you could not wear any jewelry. And no wedding band was permitted. They handed out tickets to people who took the communion. And if you wore a ring, you didn't get a ticket to take communion with the church. And they think we're hard. That was John Wesley's crowd. They changed their teachings, allowed a wedding ring around 1872. The Presbyterians followed suit, and in no time, everything is accepted. And a, a, a writer of the book was talking to a Methodist pastor. He said, Today you can do anything and never get kicked out of the Methodist church. What's your point, Brother Woods? There was a time when that kind of preaching was in season. Nobody would condemn you in the church world for preaching that kind of thing because everybody understood. It's common sense, man. It's common decency. It's out of season now, my friend. You stand up and preach that message today. It's a most inopportune time to preach it. It's not a time when it's acceptable. It's not a time when people are ready to listen to it. They're going to take you crazy. They're going to cast you out as a fool and think that you are just lost your marbles. I'm telling you, don't change the word. You got to preach it anyway. Glory to God. You got to tell the truth anyway. Anybody here say, making any sense say, let me encourage you ladies. I know right now is not a time. It's, it's difficult time. Let me encourage you. The story was called, I think, Perpetua and Fasticia. Written in those first couple centuries. Told the story of a couple. And in there we learn. The world obviously had a, observed that the Christians didn't wear jewelry and they dressed modestly. And when they brought those young maidens and those Christian women into the arenas to mock them, to ridicule them, to slay them. They would dress them in pagan garb and put ornaments and jewelry on them in order to shame them because they knew they were women who didn't dress like that. The Roman world was filled with ornamental uh, coverings. The Roman world was filled with lewd dress uh, and all kinds of, of costly array. And today, the Christian world has bought into that mess and we dress as pagan as the rest of the group. The world again needs to see and we may suffer for it. Then let us suffer for it, glory to God. Because it's still worth preaching. It may be out of season, but we got to preach it anyway, glory to God. Hallelujah. I tell you, if it's worth living for, it's worth dying for. If it ain't worth dying for, it ain't worth living for. Amen. Amen. Now I want to take this and I want to give you a thought from that verse. I could preach so much here, but I just want to give you a thought. Young people, here's Paul's advice to Timothy. You need to proclaim your faith and engage your culture. What do I mean by that? One thing that's happened with holiness people is they don't have any clue what's going on in their world. And they have so written everybody off in this world. And I know there's a lot of crazies out there. I know people make themselves so unattractive and so downright disgusting that it's hard to even want to be in the presence. I'm sorry for that. It's terrible. It's a tragedy. But let me tell you something. There's also some Holy Ghost filled saints that's sitting on pews today that were once a part of that junk. They were in drugs, they were dope heads, they were living in the gutter. This man testifies no one would even preach to him, no one came to knock on his door. The mercy of all mercies, how God had mercy upon him. But I'm going to tell you something right now, young people, listen to me. This world is aggressive. Satan is an aggressor. He's not passive. Homosexuality is aggressive. 
It's violent. It's militant. And if we're not militant in our faith, we are going to be absolutely pushed away into oblivion. And we're not going to have any effect upon this world. I want to see young men in this church who are not afraid to engage their culture, who are not afraid to walk up to a tattooed, body-pierced, orange-haired freak who is loud in left field and be willing to engage him in conversation to lead him to the Lord Jesus Christ and declare, if you can be so bold, sir, so as to proclaim your liberalism and your godless humanistic ideas, then let me be ever more so bold to proclaim the King of glory and the truth of His holy word. Hallelujah. We need young women who are able to engage young women. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what the father or what color their skin is. Somebody's got to talk to them so they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we're not careful, We'll become such separatists and so holy that we will never go out there and put a finger on that wall and preach to it. We can show everything wrong, but we're unwilling. And I'm telling you something, I know it's hard because the world is freakish. I'm telling you sometimes, for me, I don't even know how to relate to a guy that's got video phones. I don't have an iPod. It's not a sin to have one. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you there are so many things in their world and they're so caught up in. Sometimes they're lingo. You don't even know what they're saying. It's like a foreign language. And yet, we've got to remember that's a soul. That's a life. That's God's creation. I know the devil's perverted it. I know the devil's distorted it. That's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to mark that body over. He wants to put all kinds of tattoos all over. He wants to put as many holes as he can. Why? Because it reminds you of God. We're made in the image of God. And he doesn't want that man to look like a man. He doesn't want that woman to look like a godly woman. Because it reminds him of the holy place he got kicked out of. And of the holy God that cast him out of heaven. And he wants to pervert and destroy every sense of God's image that he can do. But I still believe that some of those folks can be saved. I'm telling you, it's not easy. But if you think you can just sit on your seat and sit in your homes in the comfort of your homes or the comfort of this church, young people, old people, everybody in this church this afternoon, and just say, well, I'm glad that I'm not that way. And Yeah, they're crazy, and I'm glad I got my mom and my dad, and I got a good home to be raised in. Then let me tell you right now, this church is going to die with you. It's going to die with where we are right now. We're not going any further than where we're at. Somebody's got to engage this culture. Somebody's got to walk out of that dumbed down, unlogical, illogical culture that is freakish, that is foolish, that playing with gadgets that's been led down a road and they don't even know where they're going or what they're doing. Their minds are mush. And somebody's going to have to be able to walk up to them, sit down beside them in the hardies, share a track with them, give them the Word of God, say something to them and say, hey, let me tell you something about how Jesus changed my life. Have you ever heard about Jesus? We've got a generation. We need to let them know you've got to be aggressive in your faith. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. where my daughters are at and sometimes I've tried them. What do you mean you've spent days with that person and not once told them about your Lord? So-and-so asked this and -and so-and-so asked that. Well, what answer them? The answer to their life is Jesus Christ. I'm not here just to be Mr. Nice Guy. I've got a message to preach. Yes. I'm not here to disturb and say, oh, that's a nice preacher up the road. I really like him. And oh, he's got a nice wife and he's got the nicest girl. Well, that's fine. Right. And I'll tell you what, they won't be saying such nice things about us when they're dead and in hell. Right. Amen. They'll be cursing our name. They'll be swearing against us because we never told them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let me tell you somewhere right now. He said, Timothy, if they be out of season, if they be in season, but you preach. You tell the word. You preach the word. They're going to turn their ears away from the truth. It don't matter. You preach it anyway. You tell it everywhere you go. And you boldly declare the word of God, Almighty. Oh, Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
That may cut across our grain. That may upset us a little bit. But this church isn't going to grow until it engages the world that's around it. That world out there is so foreign to us, and I know how foreign it is. I walk out in it, around it. I know how freakish it is. I understand it. But if you don't proclaim this faith, Christianity hasn't grown because it got a a bunch of folks or a few folks and sopped away in some sanctuary. Catholicism tried that. They took their monks and they hit them out in the hills. Yeah, I'll tell you what they are. They're nothing more than museums now. Yeah. Even the old St. Bernard's gone anymore. Helicopters that took the place of him. And they're no longer using them to rescue folks because they got GPS and all other kind of mess going on. And they've outdated that stuff. But that's what they thought. We can live holy. We'll just separate ourselves from the culture. God never prayed. Jesus never prayed for us to be separated from this culture. In principle, in lifestyle, yes. But in physical contact, no. We've got to engage it. I'm not talking about approving of it. I'm not about condemning it. But I'm talking about you can't get out there to be able to do anything until you engage it. Until you can engage someone in conversation. And many of us sit around and it's some people that are so weird we can't even talk to them. I understand it. It's difficult. It's hard. I don't even know how to do it sometimes, but do it anyway. Ask God to give you a door. Ask God to give you a word. Carry some tracks in your pocket. Leave something with somebody. Do something that says, I'm alive. I believe in God. I'm not dead. And I'm a saint of God and I'm not ashamed of it. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. I'll be frank with you. I grew up in a church weak on evangelism. But I had a love for God. I didn't witness near as much as I ought to have. It was just a church weak. We did a lot on preaching to the church. We did little on preaching to the world. That's a fact. But I'm telling you something. That's not what I want for my children. And that's not what I want for the generation today that's here in this church. I thank you, young ladies. I thank you, young men, for what you're doing and for the life you live. We want to hear some testimonies. You come into this church. I witnessed to a man the other day. And I told him about my life in Jesus Christ. And you know what? He thought I was so crazy. And made fun of me. But you'll find out something. It feels so good (laughs) to tell about Jesus Christ. This world will push you in a corner and make you think you are a nobody. Keep your religion in your house. The church needs to push the world in the corner and say, my pot's not cracked. Your pot's cracked. I'm not upside down. You're upside down. I'm not the one that's messed up. You're the one that's messed up. Get that written book in you. Get a fire burning down in your heart. Get strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Watch the influences that are that are in your life and that are coming against you. Get filled with the written Word of God and let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. And march out into this world a militant soldier for Jesus Christ. And pray to God as you're walking through Walmart or wherever it is you're going in your job, whatever you're doing, that God will open up a door for you that day to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell somebody about why you live the way you live. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. Oh, Brother Woods, I got these folks, they go to the church down the road, and I've been telling them, I've been talking to them, but I ain't getting anywhere. Then stop. That's your problem. Quit reaching the church. You might be surprised the success you'll have if you'll just go down to that woman that's a harlot. They never darken the church door. Her hair is disheveled and she don't look so good. But you go down there and start showing her the real love. Because I'll guarantee you where she's at, she don't know anything about love. 
Yeah, you just go there and start showing her the love of God and you'll find out the difference you can make. Our problem is, is we're trying to reach the church. There's some place for that if they really want truth and some folks that can be rescued out of that garbage. But for the most part, they're gone. The majority of that crowd, you can write them off. They're gone. They're not all gone. There's a few that's hungry, but now you hear me right now. Those hungry ones, I believe what you're going to see in the next... A little while is they're going to start showing themselves and they're going to start coming out. And you hear me, if they don't get out, they're going to be consumed. Uh huh. It's going to be just like I was. I got it all together. I'm okay. No, you, what you don't realize is that constant bombardment of that liberal pulpit every day has affected your thinking. And you don't think like you used to think. And no people, I've talked to them, you just talked to them. They've been in that liberal church and they say, they're still living home. They still got it right on the outside, but their thinking's what's changing. A little bit by little bit, their thinking is changing. And I'm here to tell you, God's drawing the people out. I'm here and they're telling me, Brother Woods, it's getting terrible. Well, then get out of that mess. Because if you don't get out of that mess, you're going to be, you're going to be duped by it and deceived by it. And, and yes, there's a message to those folks. And I want to help them, but I'm going to tell you, the gospel message we need to take is to that world out there that don't know anything about God. They haven't heard about it. They don't know about it. And the name Jesus is as foreign as Adolf Hitler to them. Oh, yeah. They don't hear much about Him either. Amen. And if you don't feel good, I'll feel good for you because I feel good this afternoon. Hallelujah. Why don't you lift your hand and give Him thanks and praise this afternoon. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lamb of God. 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 Hallelujah. 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 Lord God, help us. Give us young men, women. Give us our children. Help us, Lord, that our sons and daughters will prophesy. Our sons and daughters will prophesy. They'll know how to engage the world and hold their own with the wicked of this world, Lord. Oh, there'll be times they won't have entered, but now they can find them. And they don't want to make them grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. God, help them to be strong in the faith. Strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory to God, glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, hallelujah. Mm, hallelujah to God. Mm, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place this afternoon, church. I don't know, I just feel like this is so important for us. I really do. You're not going to know everything when you go out there. There are going to be times you're going to get befuddled. There will be times there are going to be some folks say something to you and you're going to think, man, I don't have an answer for that. It's going to happen. But if you're real, what you can do is you can go back and you can find that answer. And when you do, it's just going to make you stronger. And next time you meet that guy, you're going to have an answer for him. Hallelujah. But that's how you learn. That's how you're going to grow. There is absolutely impossibility for me to prepare you or your daddy or your mama or the pastor to prepare you with every answer necessary. That's why you've got to get familiar with this written word for yourself. That's why you've got to know it. I can't tell you this world's coming up with more crazy, goofy questions than I've ever seen all my life because that's how a, a, a brain its fried on drugs and liberalism. That's the way it thinks. I mean, common sense people don't even think along the veins that they think of. And they ask questions that are absurd. And I'm telling you, there's an answer. It's the Holy Word of God. Amen. Glory to God. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. How many want to engage the culture? How many want to receive the torch? And how many want to have something that Jesus tells to pass it on to the next generation? I don't want to go it out when it's in my hand. Brother John, if Jesus tarries, these folks have got it tough. Right. You're absolutely right. If Jesus tarries, our children are going to face unprecedented struggles. But I want to give you the courage that Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't care what you face. If God's for you, who can be against you? Amen. 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 Build. 
Build. Build. And receive this torch. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grow. Engage. Get strong. Fill yourself with the written word of God. Hallelujah. Get it in your spirit. Get it in your mind. And let God use you as his chosen vessel for this hour. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. We're going to see a difference in this culture. We're going to see a difference in what God's going to do with us, church. And if they may not like us, there's one thing they're not going to do, and that is they're not going to ignore us. If we can't do anything more than put that sign out there that aggravates the daylights out of them every time they go up and down that road, then I want to be a thorn in their side. So that if this world rejects God, let them reject it over our protest. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let them reject it because we warned them that it was wrong and this was the way of God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise Him one more time. Would you praise Him one more time? Hallelujah. Glory! Hallelujah! 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 Woo! Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! Praise God! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. With that admonition, I say to you, Happy Father's Day. Glory to God. Let's receive the admonition of the Lord. Why don't you brothers hug a brother and say, I want to pass on the torch and I want to keep the fire burning. Hallelujah. Sisters, hug your sisters. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Woo!